clock tower, and I'm going to introduce my colleague. Yeah. Ahead, I'm uh, Dan LeBlond, and uh, I'm sort of like the construction project manager for uh, for the restoration of the clock tower. So we're going to start by showing a video. Um, so if you could show that, Danny. All right, I'm going to hit play now. Wonderful. It was an act of architectural savagery. In 2007, the most iconic piece of Biddeford's industrial history fell prey to people who, who were un unaware of its history. The former Lincoln Mill owner ordered that she, likely one of the only eight-sided mill towers in New England, and a fixture in the Biddeford community since 1853 was to be taken down, gutted of its her bell and stripped of her weather vane. Unlike the demolition of the Portland Union Station in 1961, the streets were devoid of protesters. There was no one there to protect her from being chainsawed from her base. She had sat on for over 140 years. Very few people knew it was happening. There was no media announcement or outcry about its destruction. Watch the man being hoisted on the crane with his chainsaw, sawing the tower down. The shoddy placement of the straps caused the beautiful copper roof to bend and buckle. This magnificent 26,000 plus pound structure that faithfully kept time for our community was discarded as trash and set awkwardly in front of the Lincoln Mill that she had stood upon since the 1870s, beheaded and abandoned. She was the heartbeat of our community. The honor to wind her beautiful clock and time mill life were forgotten in a sweep of a chainsaw. How could this bold act of architectural destruction happen in the 21st century? It's unfathomable. Tonight, I wanna to tell you the history of the clock tower and proudly tell you of the high school students, individuals, and organizations that kept her with us. We did not have champions protesting her destruction like Portland did in 1961. But for the last 13 years, we have had waves of people that were committed to keeping her with us and preserving her story for future generations of our community. This clock tower, the most iconic symbol of Biddeford's industrial prowess never should have been taken down. Join us, be one of the hands who helps us to raise her to a place of honor in our community as a symbol telling the world that Biddeford is back stronger and more innovative than ever before. So we are here and we are here as ordinary citizens of this community to do something extraordinary. And we, we ask all of you to join us in our quest. So in a minute, I'm going to go through the history of the clock tower, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dan, who is spearheading the construction. So you'll notice, you can see where, um, where the in, inadequate way it was brought down caused a lot of destruction to the roof. And like many people in the community, like myself, I, I never realized what happened. Um, I became involved in it in 2018. I saw it um, in Doug, on Doug Sanford's property and I just wondered what it was. And when I found out what it was, it, it, it was part of my goal to um, change its trajectory and honor her.
Danny, we could probably go to the um, presentation now, if you don't mind. <clears throat> Just as it hits the bottom there, you can see fascia board go flying off. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the historic Biddeford Mill clock tower, her story. And, and just as a note, we call it the Biddeford Mill clock tower. Um, technically, it was the clock tower that was on top of the Lincoln Mill, but it, but it really was the clock tower that timed mill life. Okay, and I love this quote, at best, preservation engages the past in a conversation with the present for a mutual concern for the future. And Dr. William Mertig from the National Register of Historic Places, he was the first keeper um, of this institution. And it really shows that, you know, the past is with us now and, and it's up to us to steward it into the future. So next. So I want to spend a little time thanking everyone um, who's championed this cause. Um, my colleague, Dan LeBlanc, Ed Maxton, Dennis Letalier. These were the people in 2006 who um, removed um, pigeon um, leavings and, and really tried to restore it. Um, so a big thank you to George Collard, um, who posted a bond to save it and serves us as an invaluable resource for this clock. George No is a horologist. He's very knowledgeable about clocks and very knowledgeable and passionate about this clock. So we all thank him for his work. Um, Mayor Alan Casavan and Matt Eddy, they've, they've helped us look at options for this, which is really key. Um, and we want a big thank you to all of our volunteers. Um, and I'm, I'm, we may be missing some. I know Dan, um, Dan is going to talk about this. Ray Goslin, Cynthia Howard, Sander, and Tom Hood, Jonathan Verrill. And by the way, Jonathan Verrill um, is the grand nephew of um, Francis Spencer, who was instrumental in producing the Velux blanket. Um, Mike Johnson, Robert Harriman, and many other people. And we want to thank the mill owner. So a thank you to Doug Sanford, who allowed the structure to sit on his land since 2014. Tim Harrington and Eric Chinder, who have been gracious and wonderful and are, are allowing us to have this um, on the Lincoln Mill parking lot um, before it's placed on the River Walk in 2021. Um, Dan Cody is just absolutely fabulous. Um, you know, as you can imagine, it's really expensive to move a structure of this scope. And uh, Dan Cody did it for us at cost, which saved us over $10,000. So we really want to have a big shout out for him and the fantastic work he did. Um, and we have a long list of supporters out there who have given us gifts in kind. Daring Lumber, Taylor Rental, Jan Janess Flourish ran in events for us, Run of the Mill, Mulligans, the 99 Restaurant, all ran um, events for us. So we appreciate that. And a special shout out to the youth in our community who in 2014 championed to save this. And um, I encourage all of you to go to our Facebook page and look at their video that they created, which um, actually brought tears to my eyes. It was, it was just wonderful. Um, Sam Cohen Foundation gave us matching monies way back in 2014 for the move. Main preservation they had put it in 2014 as a list of the most endangered places in Maine. And thanks to the work of everyone, it's, in, it's listed not, it's still in danger, but it's listed as in motion. We're doing something about it. Part of Biddeford, um, who graciously, Delilah and Juanita, graciously and her, her wonderful board, they all agreed to be our fiscal sponsor. Um, Mel LeBlanc, who's Dan's son, who's an architectural engineer and a graphic designer, he did he did an amazing job in creating something that all of you will see in this presentation, um, imagining it, it um, in, in this architectural rendering. And all of my colleagues on the Friends of the Historic Biddeford Mill Clock Tower, Sandra, George, Jonathan Rarell, 
um, Dan, Mike Johnson, and uh, more, um, who've all worked tirelessly to help us to save it. Um, a big thank you to everyone. Next. Okay. So I want to just take a, a little bit of time to look at the clock tower in the context of Biddeford's industrial history. Um, so if we look at this, 1825, there was the largest textile mill that was ever built in the country, um, was erected, it burned, um, and in the 1830s, this amazing person, Samuel Batchelor, who was only 47 years old, comes to Biddeford um, and is entranced with the Biddeford side of the river. And, um, and basically catalyzes this industrial revolution that took place in our community with that reverberated all around the world. So, um, so basically, if you look at when this mill was built, which is 1853, um, it's built by the Pepperell Manufacturing Company. Um, just as a note, Samuel Batchelor, Pep, William Pepperell had nothing to do with the Pepperell Manufacturing Company. It was a name that Samuel Batchelor gave this company. Um, and it was put on a building, and I know George Pollard has done some research around this. It was a building that was actually near the Saco River. So imagine how the distance from the Saco River to um, right near the Lincoln Mill. Um, it's incredible that it was brought close to that. So but it wasn't on the Lincoln Mill in 1853. It was actually in the 1870s when there was concern over pitch roofs. They were deemed a, a fire hazard, so they put it on top of the Lincoln Mill. Um, so in 2007, um, as we all saw the tragic story of this beautiful historic structure, Chainsaw Down, um, happened. And then we can all be, a part of this wonderful story that it, it in 2021, this beautiful clock is honored again. Next. So um, if we look from a Biddeford context, and this is actually a really, thank you Renee Des Roberts at the McCarthy Library for a lot of these photos. Um, this is Biddeford back um, early, early uh, mid 1800s, I think. Um, but if you think of this in context, the population of Biddeford was only 4,200 people. In 1850, the population exploded. There was 15,000 people. Biddeford was like the, the Oz. It was um, this amazing Mecca that people came here, like Israel Chabanel, who walked from Canada in 1845 as a 19 year old because he heard about what ha was happening in Biddeford and all this amazing innovation. Um, and so right at that time, that's when this clock tower was built and, and was with us, 1853 till now. Next slide. So um, as mentioned earlier, this, it's, it's hard to imagine how magnificent this clock tower is, but um, built in 1853, um, the clock tower itself weighs 26,000 pounds. It was, it's, it's just immense and magnificent. Next slide. And so we, when you think about like kind of history in hearing and objects, you think about the people that heard the clock, the people that heard the bell. One of those was Samuel Batchelor, who I had mentioned earlier, who is an entrepreneur and um, spearheaded the Industrial Revolution in Biddeford, had repercussions all around the world, was, was um, trading cloth in China. Um, and then Israel Chabanel, as I mentioned earlier, who came here to Biddeford at 19, and he was um, really um, singularly responsible for ushering in the waves of Franco-American migration to this community. Francis Spencer, he was a Biddeford and um, his team invented the Vallet's Blanket, saving um, jobs for our community. And Sam Cohen, who was a philanthropist, they too witnessed the ringing of the bell. Next slide. And Dan will talk about this in more depth, but when you actually go into the clock room, you see people were so honored to have wound this clock that they put their names on it. And you can see Francis Spencer's 
name here next. And we can't ignore the women, the Laconia weavers. Um, they, they and many, many other women who probably the first times in their life was given this chance of economic independence by working in the mills. Um, they timed their lives to this block and bell. Next. So as mentioned and as you witnessed, 2007, the clock tower was chainsawed from its belfry. Next. Its weather vane was um, featured in the 2009 edition of Architectural Digest, basically a folk art collector in Vermont bought this, the weather vane that was on our clock tower. And here it is at the right for um, probably a pretty um, expensive price. Um, next slide. Um, so again, when it was taken down, it was thrown next to the Lincoln Mill and it languished there for seven years. And then if we, and it, there was, you move to the next slide, please. Um, and, and a big shout out again to George Collard because he, they were basically the mill owner at the time put a dumpster next to the clock tower and um, put it next to the clock tower with the intent of cutting this beautiful structure into thousands of pieces. And um, the city was actually fining this person. So George and this groundswell of support um, from all these high school students. And um, I know the Biddeford Muse Mill Museum was involved as well to save this structure from destruction because once it's gone, it's gone forever. Next slide. And I, I love this photo. Here are the kids from Biddeford High School 2014. And um, they have this touching video on what this clock tower means to them and how important it is to save it. And they were instrumental in raising these monies to move it to Doug Sanford's um, property. So um, really powerful, encourage you to look at that. Um, if you move to the next slide. So um, Maine Preservation um, named it as I mentioned earlier, one of the most endangered pieces of Maine history in 2000, it was a, the kind of the poster um, historic object in 2014 that um, could be destroyed. And once it's destroyed, it's destroyed forever. It's now in motion, thanks to all of the efforts of everyone out there who's helped us. Next slide. So many of you um, may have seen this, um, seen, seen it sitting on the Pepperell property. That's when I certainly first noticed it and thought, what, what, what is this? Um, not knowing that it came off the Lincoln Mill. And um, that was the catalyst for me. Um, please go to the next slide. So early 2019, we, um, Dan LeBlanc, myself, George, Sandra, we formed the Friends of the Historic Biddeford Mill Clock Tower um, and with the goal of it restoring it and honoring it for future generations. And we really appreciate Heart of Biddeford to be, its, to be the fiscal sponsor. Next. So January 3rd, we, the clock tower was moved. And, and in a minute, we're going to show you a video of this. But again, a big shout out to Eric Chinberg, Tim Harrington. They have been really gracious in allowing this on their property. They, they protected it um, with fencing. And we really appreciate that. Next slide. So. All of you out there, I can't see all of you, but I know you are out there. Um, really important for um, you to help us with this. I mean, again, we're just ordinary people trying to do an extraordinary thing. And um, the way that you can support it is you could buy a brick. And, and Dan will talk about this in a little bit more depth, more depth, but you know, if you're the descendant of someone who worked in the mills, um, or if you want to commemorate a loved one, this is a perfect way to memorialize your contribution. Um, we also have a GoFundMe campaign, and we are always looking for volunteers to help us restore this clock tower, help us with fundraising, because 
everyone makes a difference. And, and we've seen this in the history of this clock tower. This is not the work of just us right in 2020. It's the work of all these people, the students from Biddeford High School, the organizations, the individuals, they're all part of this. And so we need your help. So please join us. So um, I think that's the end of my slide deck, but I, I want to show, we want to show you a video. And this was um, this year when we, um, when we moved the clock tower. And um, again, big shout out to Cody Crane. They came with their amazing millions of dollars of equipment and um, really did an, an incredible job carefully, carefully moving it. So, Danny is going to show us the video. Just give us one second while she does that. So here it goes. Thanks, Danny. So it, when you look at this, it looks so tiny. Um, but as, as, as it comes closer, moving it with a strap, you're moving it in the appropriate way of moving it. So it's turn it over to what we envision happening and how we need to get there. So, Dan? Okay, first slide. Give me just one sec. Okay. I started with this project basically, like I said, in around 2006, repairing windows and uh, and just trying to keep uh, 
keep more deterioration from happening. And we worked as part of the uh, Biddeford Historical Society when we did that. Uh, the historic Biddeford Mill Clock Tower, you can see uh, where it used to stand. Uh, and on the left, uh, the deteriorated state that it is in now. And on the right, that's a rendition of what it could very well be. Next slide. Okay. This is where I learned that somebody should do something. You hear that phrase a lot. Somebody should do something. When something is wrong, somebody should do something. And my answer was to myself, why not me? Next slide, please. Uh, this is a group of our, uh, our committee. Uh, on the left, of course, is me, Dan LeBlanc. Uh, George Collard, he's a uh, mill historian. Uh, he's a uh, machinist, a uh, very good machinist. As a matter of fact, he got the non-functioning clock working on his living room table. Um, it runs for about five or six hours, and uh, then he can rewind whatever he's got for support on it. And uh, George has been uh, instrumental in me learning much more about the clock, because all I knew before was the windows and stuff. Then there's Louise Merriman. She's the one with the curly hair. And uh, she is our uh, committee chairman. And Sandra Shued, she is the uh, assistant committee chairman. Next slide, please. Okay, one of our first introductions to trying to make the public aware was this is at the Kermesse uh, in 2019. Uh, for people who don't know what that is, that is a Franco-American festival that uh, didn't take place this year because of Everybody knows what. Anyway, we tried to introduce this idea and this concept. The sketch, by the way, is something I did, uh, a hand drawing of some idea I had around three o'clock in the morning of what maybe this could become. Next slide, please. Okay, so that concept sketch of mine was inspired by a visceral image uh, of the clock tower as it sat in 2007, right after it was cut down. And uh, I don't see what the, the it's a, the painting right now is in um, in the run of the mill restaurant, and you can see that in one of the dining rooms on the wall there. Next slide, please. Okay, volunteers. That's the heart of this organization. Somebody that feels like something needs to be done, and they've seen the same calling that I did, and they're the ones that should be doing something. Uh, the clock face, this is the clock face that has always faced uh, the Lincoln Street uh, area. And uh, in the next, in the other slide, in the uh, other frame on the side, you can see my good friend Ray Gosselin, who did all of our uh, scaffolding and safety work uh, with uh, making sure everyone was safe on the site. And uh, he is a mason contractor. Next slide, please. Okay, there's the, the, over here you can see uh, what it looks like from the parking lot in the uh, Pepperell Mill complex. Uh, and uh, on the, the, uh, the other frame in the same slide, you can see George Collard sitting in some of the scaffolding. And uh, right behind his feet is Sandra Shued, her husband Tom Shued, and uh, Jameson, I don't remember his last name, and uh, our historical uh, restoration or renovation architect, uh, Cynthia Howard, is there. And this was a paint scraping party that we organized, one of the first in August. Next slide, please. There again, uh, Sandra Shute, uh, kneeling, working with scraping, and uh, Jameson again, and um, my friend Cynthia Howard. Again, thank, uh, next slide. Okay, this is moving day, Oops. moving day, January 3rd, 2020. Um, I got a reprieve from my vacation to Florida over the winter. Cody Crane of Auburn, Maine, gave us the most generous donation of time, equipment, and expertise. Thank you, Dane Cody, and your professional gentle crew. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, this is just a good shout out to them. And you can see that they've used care and those beams go in there and they're resting on a supporting structure. Unlike the first time it was moved, 
where they depended on the arches above the windows to actually support the entire weight, thereby damaging all of those window frames at the top. Um, thank you for the for the for the very generous uh, donation, which probably exceeds ten thousand dollars on his part. Next slide, please. And then many thanks to Bruce Hackett, who just recently uh, in May worked on. Uh, uh, removing the lead paint that was on all of the wooden surfaces of the, uh, the structure. They were originally, I believe, in 1984 covered with latex paint, which has since completely deteriorated and peeled off. He provided uh, labor and materials during uh, this COVID pandemic. Since his crew was not busy doing anything, he generously allowed them or generously gave us uh, the use of his crew and his materials to take care of a very important task. Thanks for your very generous contribution. Next slide, please. Okay, and you can see one of his people working and they know what they're doing. Next slide, please. Okay, over here you can see where a lot of the deterioration is. And I told them don't bother scraping that because all of those pieces are so far gone, they will have to be replicated and replaced. So that is all of the, so, uh, the soffit, which is the overhanging pieces, and the fascia, that's the vertical pieces above the clocks and the, and the window faces. Next slide, please. And where are we going to put it? Well, we have looked at several sites and considered them all and asked uh, for guidance and help from uh, the city's planning office. And uh, we've had a second meeting with them since this and uh, we're still considering other sites. There are more options. So the building that you see is across the river uh, of the west branch of the Saco River, and that's on the Saco side, Saco Island. Next slide, please. And this is from the same area, and you can see the shadow of the big Merck Tower there. And uh, we're looking toward uh, the, the historic mill district, and you can see just the cupola up in the, near just to the right of center of the city hall clock tower. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the river where it was dammed up to provide water power for the entire mill district that you see along the river there. So uh, that went down through uh, tunnels under the mills and powered water wheels that turned the shafts that ran the machinery. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see a lot of the deterioration and the worst face on that uh, left-hand picture uh, is right there. Some uh, temporary repairs have been made to that and all of that structure that's under the roof that's holding out uh, the fascia board and soffits uh, has to be worked on and some of it replaced completely. Next slide, please. Okay, so through decades of neglect, weather's entered damaging uh, important structural components. I called a friend who's experienced in reconstruction with 19th century buildings. His name's Robert Harriman. He agreed to come and provide some advice concerning methods and materials. He's my sailing buddy, so we get along pretty well. And uh, in our discussion, he mentioned that his grandfather had worked in the mill, uh, actually in, in the historic Lincoln Mill, and he worked in maintenance. And right after that, I told him, he says, you know, people from maintenance, uh, every seven days, someone had to go up and wind both of the, both of the cable spools, uh, 140 pound weights, one of which powered the clock mechanism and the other which powered the bell. And the bell would ring on the hour or it would ring uh, when it was time to go to work and when it was time to leave work and for the lunchtime. So, um, Next slide, please. Okay, uh, a lot of the writing was on the surfaces and what you see to the right side of this picture is uh, the clock face, the back side of the clock face and how it's fastened there. It just simply cleated in place uh, on the fascia that's just, just aside from the, uh, the timber that you see on the left. That uh, 
timber has the same profile shape uh, for its length. Uh, it looks pretty much like somebody copied a kite and it fits into the corner, which is a 22 degree angle and comes to a point toward the center of the clock tower building. And Rob was looking for, maybe his grandfather left a signature there. Next slide, please. This was the third signature that he looked at. It's almost as if his grandfather had put his finger on it. Leon Harriman, 43 Myrtle Street, or no, 45 Myrtle Street, sorry, uh, Bitterford. And he signed it on February 20th, 1934. Next slide, please. Needless to say, Rob Harriman was ecstatic to see that. And he says, this looks like a fun project. I'll give you some help. And this is what we're looking at. A lot of the timbers that are associated with this have deteriorated. Uh, on the right side, you can see where there's a couple of timbers, which are actually six by sixes, which were spliced in to assist in the move because it was physically unsound to try to move it as it was. Uh, a splice was made in order to reinforce. Uh, the timber that you see that's all the rotting in there was originally joined to one of those kites, kite profile timbers that were in there. And those are about 22 feet long. Uh, the remaining part of them was 22 feet long. They went down into the mill structure by about 36 feet. Next slide, please. This is a picture of, uh, you can see in the middle, there's a timber in there with some white paint. Uh, that was a salvage timber that was used to splice on uh, in order to reinforce and fix that frame uh, that, that had failed. Uh, you can see that uh, in the foreground upper, uh, there's another piece that went in there and that's one of the radial pieces that go off of the eight main members of the spider that forms each of the two frames that hold the center of the building together and, uh, and hold, hold and support the roof up. Next slide, please. Okay, these are two pieces of those timbers uh, that you saw the splice repair on there. Uh, they were cut off and a new or a replacement solid piece was put in and spliced off with an adjoining uh, two by 10 timber. Next slide. And this is where that eight-legged uh, or eight-sided construction that I like to call a spider frame is joined. And you can see there's one solid piece that goes all the way through the center, which is no longer quite so solid, but it still has a substantial amount of good wood left to it. It hasn't all rotted through. Uh, it's held together uh, originally by that a uh, rectangular piece with uh, the eight bolts that go through each of the timbers and that keeps them from sliding apart or moving and just taking out their original toenails. Next slide, please. This is the reinforcing structure that was installed uh, by George Collard and the crew that he hired to uh, do some of the remedial work so that the clock tower could be lifted and moved to a safe location uh, pending uh, further restoration. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, when you get a lot of water into a place and there has been uh, pigeon droppings in there and uh, it's left to go for a certain amount of time, uh, certain seeds begin to sprout and everyone can see that the decking in the floor and the supporting fire, uh, fighter frame is really no place for a garden. Next slide, please. Now, this is an interesting thing. I've tried to take a picture of this before, and thanks to modern technology, I did this without a flash, and this is in the darkened upper attic space of the dome. And you can see uh, the uh, rectangular or the, uh, the eight-sided mass going up through, and it's supported in place. You can see where wedging has been done uh, around the, uh, the eight-sided spider that goes up into the metal and that was to hold the mast in place. And then there are cleats at the base of that. And that's what that 21 foot tall mast that supported the weather vane in, in place for all those 140 years. Next slide, please. Now you can see that uh, that supporting frame that Mr. Collard had 
uh, engineered in there. Uh, it was designed to take all of the weight of the tower off of the window arch and the beams, the steel beams that you saw when we lifted the thing uh, went through that, uh, through the window opening and rested on that supporting structure. Next. <coughs> okay, a temporary residence. This is one error in my presentation that I didn't mean to leave there, but it should say 2014 through 2020. And I'm thanking Doug Sanford for his gracious loaning of a resting place on his Pepper Mill campus, uh, providing it a place to wait for its restoration. And uh, people wanted to know what we were doing, and we spent a lot of time when we first started scraping paint answering questions. Uh, and um, we had this sign made, uh, this beautiful sign that Dennis Latelier, one of the first people to uh, introduce me to this bell and get him involved in his Biddeford Historical Society project fixing windows and trying to stabilize the structure. So he owns perfect signs and he made this sign for us. Next slide, please. Okay, the other sites that we had under, cons under consideration. This is, uh, if you see the gazebo on the side and the flags, flags were at a half mass at that time and I don't remember why, but uh, the, um, uh, the site that we thought would be good for the mill tower would be entering Biddeford right there at uh, Mechanics Park. Next slide, please. And this is the view coming from Saco of where that would be, uh, probably right behind that uh, walkway sign. Next slide, please. Another place that we considered was the building that is now for sale uh, at the corner of Lincoln and Elm Streets. Um, and uh, the structure would have been either on top of that building and the rest of the building used as a museum or the building adjacent to it, which is probably vacant right now. Next slide, please. Another site that considered was the site of the main energy incinerator. And um, I always thought it would be a good idea to maybe tear down uh, the monument to folly that exists there of putting a trash incinerator in the mid middle of a vibrant city uh, and replacing it with a nice monument uh, recalling the city's great path and its contribution to the industrial revolution and to society in general. Next slide, please. And here's a rendition uh, made by my son, uh, Mel, Mel LeBlond. And this was my Father's Day present to me from him uh, and it depicts a very good look at what uh, the tower might look like uh, located right there where that, uh, that uh, smokestack was. Next slide, please. And this is, a, this is uh, an actual aerial uh, or a satellite image. Uh, and he's replaced here the, uh, the the stack, the Merck stack, with uh, the proposed clock tower, uh, clock tower memorial or clock tower uh, monument, and uh, that is actually labeled as Canal Park in uh, the Biddeford Historic Mill District Master Plan, and it would be on right on the Riverwalk. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is some of our literature that uh, that he he reproduced for us and uh, it shows it gives us a brief history of the Biddeford Mill clock tower uh, there's a shot of the downtown looking down Lincoln Street and in the center of that small center image you can see that the uh, the Lincoln Mill clock tower and uh, then we have we start talking about the buy a brick program and uh, next slide, please. Uh, Louise mentioned that uh, we do know where the weather vane that was on top exists. And we're hoping that uh, this gentleman, if he's an elderly gentleman, uh, understands that he, he picked this up and probably his good heart will tell him that it's been in his safekeeping for restoration to where it really belongs. Uh, right back on our middle clock tower. 
Next slide, please. Okay, clocks are a prominent feature of important historic progressive cities. The first clock to the left is, is in Rouen in France. Okay, that is a very, very large French city. The next clock is on uh, St. Was it St. Basil's? St. Basil's Cathedral, and that is in uh, Red Square in Moscow. And uh, the third clock is the astronomical clock built in 1410, and it is still working today. The original clock mechanism has been repaired over and over and over again. And all of the figures on this thing move. It not only tells you the time of day, it tells you what day of the week it is, what month it is, and where in the astronomical calendar thing, things are. So, and this is in Prague, Czech Republic. Next slide, please. And some people may recognize this. This is the Union Station, Portland, Maine, before it was torn down to make room for, of all things, a concrete block shopping mall uh, with a non-pitch roof with a flat roof and uh, no decoration at all. I mean, right now we have tattoo parlor, uh, a small grocery outlet, uh, a bar room, a billiards room, and several other things there. But uh, our history is gone for something so temporary and so transient. Next slide, please. And this again is a rendition of what it could look like replacing the the uh, Mercury smokestack, or Merck smokestack. Next slide, please. Okay, the way people can help, uh, if you can't donate time or a lot of money, uh, you can donate a little space in the memorial. And I like to call this buying a brick and a walkway through time. Next slide, please. Please lend your support, and you can do this through Heart of Biddeford, and uh, they will give you a, uh, or actually you can get it right from our own Facebook page or our website. They will give you a place to send your check, which is uh, Heart of Biddeford, and it would be in care of, uh, or in care of our Heart of Biddeford, but the check made out to uh, Biddeford, Biddeford Mill Clock, Clock Tower Committee, Restoration Committee. So uh, you'd be helping to restore Biddeford's place that it earned in the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. I'd like to thank you, and uh, that's all I have. Questions? I'd like to entertain any questions. We do have um, we do have one question in the chat room already. Um, the first the first one was about the weather vane, which I think you touched upon uh, whether it could be reproduced or moved back. And then the other part was uh, what happened to the bell. Uh, the bell, we're not sure what happened to it, but it was sold after the clock tower was taken down. Uh, nobody had any video of that being removed, uh, but the bell was quite substantial. I'm sure it was in excess of a ton and a half. It was sold into, um, this is Louise here at Social Distance. It was actually sold um, in Merrill on um, the bell. So we don't, that's all we know. Yeah, we haven't located it. We do know where the weather vane is. Uh, if we use the original bell and had a working thing, we would have to do something to muffle it because it would be right in a in the middle of a public park and not a hundred feet above people's heads. So um, a smaller bell might be in order, uh, just in order to give the feeling of what this was all about. And uh, Georgia assures us that this clock will run just as well as, as it ever has. Um, so that, that's basically what happened to the bell. Uh, we could replace it. There are bells uh, of not so historic value uh, that are available. Another question, please. Uh, there is one more question that says, what was, uh, Tawny asks, what is the, what was the reason that it was cut off? 
uh, it was determined by the owner of the building at the time that uh, it was beyond his economic means uh, to do the work necessary to the bell to keep more pieces of it from falling into the street, possibly causing harm. Uh, and um, he was told to do something with it and the solution at the time. There was no ordinance in the city of Biddeford in 2007, uh, no, no facility to protect historic structures. Since 2013, and I credit it to the destruction of this tower or to the removal of this tower, there is an, uh, a committee or a commission in the city uh, for historic preservation. And when it comes to those things that are on the historic list, um, those things will be looked at. And whatever you determine to do with your ownership of this historic thing is going to be put to the test by the Historic Preservation Commission. So you can see that, you know, it was, it, it did make some good for the town to do that. Great. Um, I'm actually going to unmute uh, Susan so that she can ask a question. I think, can I, Danny, or do you have to do it? I think you might have to do it. No, um, Krista, by the way. I might have to do it? Okay. Oh, what do I do? <laughs> okay, well, you got it. I think Danny did it, so we're good. Hi there. Hi. So we were wondering why not just put the clock back where it was before it being taken taken uh, th there was a problem with with that because it has so much deterioration uh, it would never pass an insurance audit or an insurance inspection for insuring the entire Lincoln Mill building because it will be on the top of the Lincoln Mill building they plan to put a swimming pool at the top of that and um, they would want it pretty much rebuilt entirely new before it would be put back up there. And then they'd need some kind of certification that it was done, you know, uh, fail safe, as fail safe as can be done. And, and was, there's no way that that's gonna happen, uh, barring any windstorm that might come up. Because when you get up 100 feet down in the city of Biddeford, you have all of that wind that can come from the east, or the northeast or the northwest. Uh, and you can see by the faces of the, of the clock tower itself how much weather it's taken just by the damage on the, on the different surfaces. Dan, do you have, <clears throat> do you have a, a rough estimate as to how much the total cost of, of, of the partial restoration you're going to be looking at? Well, I am not a planner estimator, but a rough guess, uh, knowing what I know, uh, of having dealt with projects much lower capacity than this, about 250,000 for the restoration of the clock itself. And that doesn't in, does not include the iron gantry that it would sit on. Nice. It would actually be a steel construction somewhere between 12 and 18 feet high. I would prefer 18 feet high making it less prone to vandalism. Right. Uh, steel is, I mean, what are you gonna do to steel? You're gonna damage the paint? If right. it's on a wood structure, it would it would be prone to vandalism, such as starting a fire on it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm it sure it would be down closer to where people can actually sit yeah. with it or sit around it. You saw the benches around the rendition. Yeah. Right. Uh, the idea of that was you had you had several ways to approach the tower, and it's pretty much like thinking about whatever problem you're dealing with at this time. Yeah. So you you'd come to it. And you'd sit and it would be a good place to contemplate and and pass just a little bit of time uh, to ask yourself important questions, make a decision, and then take a path. Take a path to, a, to your solution. Well, it would seem uh, from your estimate of two, uh, quite a million uh, that for some of uh, a project... It's hard to spend these days, build a house. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. That isn't really a lot of money given the magnitude of what you're doing and the fact that you have several wealthy people that are involved in projects in that immediate area, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, $250,000 to a few people whose names I won't mention is chump change. Also, uh, looking at federal matching grants, I'm sure you have, uh, and- you We know, need that, help that, with that. 
That's well, what you really need help with. Well, that's, that's, that's somebody that knows how to write and navigate the system. Well, there you go. That's that's almost essential before you even begin. I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, we need we need a, a we need to round out our committee. Right now, we have four really active members. What we need is 15, 15 or so really active members, right. each of which could specialize in something, each of which right. could right. contribute their talent. Well, a grant writer that has had experience in historical restoration projects would really round out that committee. <laughs> I think so, yes. Well, listen, uh, we've had, <laughs> Yes, we have had offers from uh, Chinberg Corporation, uh, which is in charge of the construction on the present Lincoln Mill. Um, and, you know, we're trying to arrange a, a meeting, a mutually agreed upon time for a meeting. Uh, where we can present what we're doing and then we can field some ideas from them. Uh, it's going to take a lot of talking and quite a bit of diplomacy between one thing and the other. Uh, I think that uh, Tim Harrington and the Chinberg Corporation uh, are, are really, really good partners in this type of thing because it would benefit them to have this nearby. Uh, it, it just makes it another good attraction. I like the river walk because uh, the city is wholeheartedly into that. Uh, however, if we move it to the river walk, then we have to renew uh, its historic designation under different auspices. Under, you know, we have to find a different reason for it to be a uh, nationally historic preserved uh, fixture. So if we leave it in the mill district, uh, right within the mill district, anywhere, uh, toward downtown from Pearl Street, uh, we don't have that problem because that is still the historic mill district. So this is the way I understand the way it was read to me, uh, why, why that's not a good location. Uh, even if, it, even if you, my thing is like, you could see it from the train as you come into or out of Biddeford and Saco, uh, and it would be right at eye level almost. Um, so any other comment? Um, I'm opening it up to Dr. Rawl, who has a couple of questions. Again, please. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, your voice. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm opening, uh, I just unmuted Jeff Rawl, who has a question or comment. Hi, um, it's Jeff from MacArthur Library. I just had a few quick things to add. I am unmuted now, right? Yes. You are. Okay. Um, First, I just want to, and Dan and Dan and Louise and I are all on the board of the, I'm the director of MacArthur Library in Biddeford, and we're all on the board of Biddeford Historical Society. So first, just wanted to add thanks to the Biddeford Historical Society for hosting, or not hosting us, but this is a fireside chat. Biddeford Historical Society does a series of programs like this, and the director of the Historical Society, Catherine Glenn, was here, but she had to go. So I just wanted to mention that. She put a comment in there too, but I just wanted to give a shout out to the historical society just quickly to dan's point about the historic preservation commission i'm on the historic preservation commission for the city i don't know exactly when the commission started it was at least it was it was before 2007 though so it wasn't necessarily tied to the to this but a few years ago our ordinance became much stronger so we actually issue certificates of appropriateness now so whether we would have approved it or not, because we have to look at all sorts of things like structural issues and safety. But I just wanted to clarify that about the historic preservation that it did exist before 2007 and we're much more active and have much more, many more teeth in the ordinance now than we ever used to. And then it's great, it's great that we, it, it's great that these folks have taken this on and moved it, well, physically moved, physically moved it, but also moved the project so far along it's we, we needed an individual an independent group in Biddeford to do this I was very I'm a I'm the president of the board of Biddeford Mills Museum and I think I was vice president back in 2014 so I was very closely involved with the relocation to Doug's property back in 2014 I was very involved with the Lincoln Mill Clock Tower from 2011 2014 and I just wanted on behalf of a few different individuals and groups that were that weren't that weren't mentioned just because there isn't really a complete list out there, but I feel like I owe it to the to them because they did quite a lot for the first relocation in 2014. Um, 
local business angel and, and i just feel like i owe them this 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 thing so local business angel rocks was a donor state rep ryan's fecto was a donor i actually personally asked burns fencing to build that fence around it in 2014 and burns fencing donated it so the fencing did not come from Chinberg. It came from Burns Fencing. And I was the one who actually asked. We did. We do a lot of work with Burns at MacArthur. And I asked them to donate that. And the fence that are around it was built by Burns. Uh, that, that's the original location from 2014 we until talking. just recently, until 2020. I'm talking, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about when it was moved in 2014. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, the fencing that Louise mentioned was provided by Chinberg. Where um, right now. Yeah, so it oh, where it is now. Actually, okay. So, yeah. so both, so both Burns and Chinberg, obviously, I thought you were talking about one in 2014 and then the Cohen foundation did give $10,000. Mm -hmm. Um, and the actual single largest donor. And so this is sort of pointless to acknowledge this person, but the single largest donor was an individual who wished to remain anonymous at the time because the first relocation in 2014 from memory cost somewhere between 25 and 30 grand and the high school students were instrumental in creating a video and, and creating a lot of interest around it. But the single largest donor was one private individual who doesn't even live in Biddeford. I don't, I don't believe that that person lived in Biddeford. And then Scott Jocelyn actually needs to be mentioned. His name should be mentioned. He used to be the chief operating officer for Pepperell Mill Campus, worked very closely with Doug, was on the board of the museum with me. He was the other individual that along with George purchased it privately and saved it. And George deserves a ton of credit and was put in a ton of time and ton of work. But Scott shouldn't really go unmentioned because he he actually and George both purchased it privately and Scott was really helpful in in in, in, in asking for Doug's permission to put it on his properly so on his property so i just wanted to mention i just was i just wanted to you know mention that, that those individuals were all um involved and organizations were involved and in, in in the relocation in 2014 and i scott and i were there well many people were there the night it was moved in 2014 and it was quite an operation i think we did it on an august night in 2014 at about two in the morning or one in the morning to avoid traffic so Anyway, thank you for letting me mention all that. Jeff, thanks for that. And, and I'll, I'll want to speak to you later because we want our slides to reflect that. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so are there any more questions? I know we've got some comments in the chat if anybody wants to take a look at some of the comments. And um, Catherine, did you want us to unmute and ask, so that you could ask any questions? Um, yeah, hi. Um, I just had a, a few, um, I've worked on other historic preservation um, things and really, truly, there are ways to track who has ownership of, say, for example, the bell. Um, and it's it's really great that we know where the weather vane is. And I, I'm hoping that gentleman would do it because it's a win-win for them unless they want to keep it for some uh, particular reason, they will get all their money back in, in tax donations and not to mention the good PR and a tons of other stuff. Uh, the bell, from what I remember, because my um, uh, great uh, grandfather was the uh, watchman or was the security person at the, the cotton mill, at the Lincoln mill. And um, was one of those folks that wound the clock. And um, my mother, when all of it happened, we were appalled. And there should be news articles. And perhaps now that the Tribune is closed, we can get them to help us do some research. But I believe the bell was bought from somebody in the Baltimore-ish Maryland area uh, via eBay, actually, or some online bidding thing. Um, I know that for many of the people that worked at the mill, the bell had some particular significance um, and there had been a dedication or something. So it would be wonderful to see if anybody uh, could talk to uh, folks and find out the, the history of it. Some of the local historians that might know a lot more about what's going on. Um, I'm a... Uh, uh, Sorry, I was just going to say thank you. Eight or so, um, and many family members worked in the mill, so I think it would mean a lot to a lot of people. And I love the idea of of the bricks. 
you for your comments, Catherine. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, as a staff member at MacArthur, and I'm sure Jeff will say this as well, we have a great um, archivist and local historian. So that's something that we could definitely help out the committee with um, any kind of research. And also, I'm sure that there are stories that are out there that might need to be gathered at some point as well. So thank you for sharing your stories. Does anybody have any follow up questions? If you want to raise your hand or put them in the comments. And I should also say I'm here with socially distant from Dan. But <laughs> Not far enough. <laughs> good. But That's good. If you have, you can always um, text us on Facebook, message us on Facebook if you have um, any questions. And um, Catherine, who um, made some of those comments, um, I'd love to have you message us on Facebook with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, either either uh, Louise will respond or I will respond. I usually wait for her to say something. So. But uh, any any technical questions or anything having to do with construction, uh, I'll answer. Uh, I'll field any volunteers who want to lend a hand, actually get their their hands dirty or have some expertise. Uh, I have a really nice project that probably isn't going to take a whole lot of effort. Uh, you saw all of those numbers on the clock dials, and then you saw all of those dial faces painted white. I took all of those numbers off. They're in individual boxes labeled for which face they came off of. Um, all 60 little minute marks, uh, all of the numbers, and you might notice that the four has three ones on it instead of an I and a V. Uh, so, and if you look, the three clocks that I showed you, all three of those, uh, two of the three clocks had the Roman numeral for four with four eyes on it. And that was the one in 1410 and uh, the one in Rouen, France. So um, now this clock was made in like 1853 and they were following a known style. So no, it's not wrong. <laughs> not in my opinion anyway. So. And, and we should also add that, you know, it, everyone can contribute to this. So, um, you know, anyone out there who wants to join us, um, it'd be really powerful to um, increase our committee so, so we can really make, go into the next phase of bringing it on the, on the river walk. Great. Any final thoughts, Dan or Louise? Uh, well, I, I think we've used enough of your time. Uh, you could use our Facebook site or uh, or go to our website. Uh, we don't we don't have too much activity on the website. No, basically go to the Facebook site. But um, I guess thank you everyone for attending. Um, and everyone counts. Everyone counts in this. And and we're just we are carrying the work that people did um, many years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, and it really matters. So please consider joining us and oh. um, thank you. Yeah, I have one, one other thing to add. Uh, we are doing something. Uh, I have a volunteer named of David Mochler. Uh, he's in biological sciences at the University of New England and his hobby is photography and he's pretty darn good at it. And uh, he has volunteered to take a picture of every single one of the visible uh, inscriptions inside the clock tower and catalog where they are in a grid format on each of the clock tower faces or each of the window faces. Uh, and we'll, we'll name and number those and they'll come out in a spreadsheet because uh, he's an organizer and he'll probably put this all on a nice spreadsheet so that somebody can, can, can research out uh, who these people were and possibly connect them to their relatives. Uh, and a person who's volunteered to do just that is Daniel Bushi, who has been on many city committees. And, uh, and I really appreciate his offer of help. And I met him through Facebook. Dan and Louise, can I jump in and, and ask a quick question? Yes. Just because, and, and this is for my own benefit as well as everyone else in here. Do you, do the, friend, the Friends of Biddeford Mill Clock Tower, and I know you explained why you're calling it Biddeford Mill instead of Lincoln Mill, they have their own Facebook page, I think, right? Because I just noticed Danny posted the Historic, Historical Society um, Facebook, but I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the friends have their own. Is that right? 
Yes, you're Jerry. absolutely right. Thank you. Okay. Jack. All right. I'm going to search it out and put it in the in the chat. Thanks, Danny. I, I just happened to notice that and I was like, oh, I think they have their own Facebook page, their, their own Facebook. So the Historic Society hosted the, or host, well, Historic Society Library kind of hosted it together with, it's a collaboration like everything else. <laughs> we need more of that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jeff, for mentioning that. And um, apologies for not mentioning the other pieces. So thanks, Danny. Yeah, if we can just put those in the slides. Yeah, so there's can... also the Biddeford Mills Museum. Yes. which you mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be a good resource for, uh, well, Daniel Bushi, I suggested it to him because I think he could probably find a lot of information on who was working at the mill and uh, what positions they have and, and maybe get a link to their, their, their families. So that, that would be nice to have. And then yeah. we'll post these things as we get them, uh, we'll post them. I will post the signatures on our web on on our Facebook page. Try to make them in groups of three or four or whatever as uh, as they come up and we get some information on them. And it's kind of interesting. This is Louise over here, socially yeah. distant Hi. over here. Um, when it's interesting when we were doing a tour of of the Lincoln Mill, um, Dan and I and myself, the person who was giving us the tour was one of the 2014 high school students who was involved in the, the campaign to um, save it back then. So um, a lot of connections in the community and we encourage all of you to, to help us with this because it's up to every one of us to save this and restore it. So thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, I have nothing else to add. So if everyone is through. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks.